culture then? Let's just start with that basic word and then we'll get the adjective. When you hear culture, what do you think of? What are some things that come to mind? If I talk about a culture, besides a bacteria in a petri. <laughs> People, okay. Why people? People make up a culture. Okay. Or bacteria, but you know, hey, you know, same thing. <laughs> so, what about what about people? They. Um, what about people? Uh, like certain beliefs. Yeah, they. Um, okay, belief, hey, that's a good one. Beliefs is a huge piece of culture. Okay. What else? <laughs> Different worldviews, different mindsets. Good. Good. Matt, what was it you said a second ago? It was a lifestyle. He said it's a lifestyle. Okay, lifestyle. Good. Excellent. So, like, are y'all all from North Carolina? Uh, originally? No. Okay. How long have you been in state? I've been here three years. Okay, been cool. A little over three years. All right. So... So I've been in North Carolina for seven years, and I've learned that there's a, at least three different cultures in North Carolina, uh, and you can tell by the barbecue. <laughs> yes. So yep. you've got you've got Eastern, you got Lexington, then you've got the stuff in the mountains that's more like I had in Georgia, like a tomato-based sauce and all that. So you know that. That tells me, like, if somebody says they like Eastern barbecue, I try not to judge them, but then I, I know a lot about their culture. Um, it's just a matter of the things that we believe, the, the things that the data points that are around us, our lifestyle choices, attitudes. One guy uh, has defined it simply as the, the behavior, the attitudes and values that you have and the behaviors that are based on those values. OK, so culture is kind of like air. It's all around us. We don't notice it until it's challenged by something else. We don't really notice our culture until somebody points out something that's different from their culture. And, or we're, we're immersed into a place we're not used to, and we realize we're not in Kansas anymore, uh, kind of like Wizard of Oz, and we, we realize we're in a different culture. So culture, if we think about culture as attitudes, values, and beliefs, and then the actions that are based on those attitudes, values, and beliefs, then now think about what is a disciple-making culture. What would that uh, tend, to, tend to look like to you? Priority is not on necess necessarily certain functions of a church, but on seeing people grow in their love for Christ. Or even come to know him. Great. Okay, what else? What else? Other guys weigh in. Discipleism kind of defines the culture. Okay, good. Good. How would that be how would that play out? What would you what would be some of the attitudes, values, and beliefs you'd see in a disciple making culture? Okay. And believe um, in it and, and in Christ and um, I don't know, in order to like do the Great Commission. Great. Good. So then what actions would you see based on those beliefs? You'd, you'd see people naturally going, but also you'd see churches sending. Good. Yeah, I like the word natural. Because it becomes something that's natural and normal. Yeah. And so, uh, Brian, you probably see this a lot in your work with the convention. Um, when you step into a almost consulting role with a church that does not have quite a disciple making culture, <coughs> and they have a they already kind of have a, a a culture built on something else for their own local church, whether it's programs or whether it's something else. Um, but if it's not a disciple making culture, that really does affect what they do and how they kind of express and live out what their kind of core beliefs and values are um, yes. kind of related. So you probably see a lot of having to almost rewire culture in some sense, uh, which is extremely difficult to do. Yeah, that's, that's right, uh, Dustin. There's a book. Uh, 
2008, I think, by a guy named Andy Crouch called Culture Making. Um, it's a book that you, you guys ought to be familiar with. Culture Making, um, if you, I read it back then, listened to a podcast from the guy and was intrigued by what he proposed. Uh, Crouch would say that we have in our DNA as um, created in the image of God, because God is a creator and we're created in his image, we have been given the gene of creation. It's in our DNA to be about creating things. And so he proposes, it, it's kind of a semantical thing, but I think it's a mind shift as well. Instead of talking about changing culture, uh, Crouch would suggest we need to create culture. That we really can't change a culture. All we can do is layer on top of an existing culture new new values, new behaviors that will over time create a new culture. And so you guys in church planting, you have a little bit of a different opportunity than than I do when I work with churches for revitalization, for instance. Because what's different, what's different between going into a church revitalization and trying to create this culture and going for a church plant and trying to create this culture? What would you guys see as a difference? Well, you're fighting... Revitalization effort, you're fighting years and years of this is how we've always done it. Um, you're fighting bad, well, I want to be careful how I say this. You're fighting quote unquote bad views of disciple making. Right. Um, they may have worked at one time, but they may not be effective anymore. And so okay. um, you're, you're fighting that in a revitalization effort. Whereas in a church planting, you're kind of, you, you are, you're creating, in, a, in, in essence, from scratch, that disciple-making culture. Um, it seems a little easier um, than revitalization. But well, it's kind of as we've discussed, you know, in uh, previous um, weeks and classes, how, you know, when you're developing kind of your evangelism strategy, when you're forming your, your small group structure, when you're even laying out your constitution and bylaws and the roles of your pastors and deacons and laity, all that. If you're, you know, if you're, uh, as Dr. Charles was saying, be able to create a culture from the ground up, you get to infuse it into those different elements and have it as, you know, your core values and it's, it's reflected in your mission statement. So your mission statement is not just to grow a healthy church, um, because we've, we've tried to do that for years in a lot of other ways, but it's to grow a healthy church through discipleship and through disciple making. Yeah. Right. And uh, so it really just infuses, and that's why I think today's lecture and topic is really, really essential um, for you know getting a church plant ready. If we're not thinking building a disciple making culture, then we're really just ignoring the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good word. I mean, the, the thing I was going to say about the church plant is it may not be easier, but you have a greater opportunity to affect change uh, more quickly yeah. because every person that comes into your church, into your church plant, your core group of believers, they're all going to come with a church culture. They're all going to come with a mindset of what ought to be. And you're going to get the DNA that you plant with is going to reproduce. I mean, that's just, it's an organic principle from chemistry, biology, whatever. It, it's true in organizational health as well. Whatever your DNA is will reproduce. <laughs> you have to fight um, to to have a good, solid, disciple-making focus from the beginning. Um, Mike Breen, uh, you guys familiar with that name? Dustin, have they been exposed to any of that uh, 3D? Yet. We haven't done much with 3DM yet. Well, Mike Breen, uh, B-R-E-E-N, would say uh, if, you, if you plant a church, you might get disciples. But if you make disciples, you'll get the church every time. Um, and so, you know, the key is where do you start? Um, you know, in, in English class, you'd say you put the emphasis on the right syllable. <laughs> you, you, you focus on what you're making. And, and it, it's kind of trite. I've heard it preached in sermons this way. And it's a little more complex than the simple statement. But the simple statement would be Jesus called us to make disciples. He said he would build his church. Um, and if you look at the pattern in Acts, we don't see Paul planting churches per se by our, by our 
definition of church planting in the 21st century, we see Paul planting the gospel and then organizing those new believers. And so the gospel is first, the making of disciples is first, and then comes the necessity of gathering as the body of Christ because you have people to make up the body. And so this little, this little um, graphic that's before you is kind of a, a tool we use mainly with church revitalization efforts, but I think it's something to put before church planners because it can be a preventative tool as much as it can be a corrective tool. We call it the high impact ministry model. And it's just these four cardinal points like a compass. Um, uh, didn't mean to make you run off there, brother. Uh, <laughs> He's coming to take a picture of the screen. <laughs> it's a rerun. He says, oh, this is a rerun. Um, uh, but those four cardinal points are pretty crucial and they're, they're pretty intuitive. Obviously they're things you're going to talk about. You may use different words, uh, but, but the top is vision. Obviously the, the main thing you have to get is a vision. You have to have a vision that's rooted in the great commission. And we can express that vision statement, mission statement, purpose statement, all of those words I'm, I'm including in the vision circle. And I know there's distinctions and nuances, but depending on who you read, those things are defined differently. So vision really is focused on the Great Commission. We can, we can phrase it in a cool way. We can phrase it in a relevant contemporary way. But the bottom line is, if your purpose is divergent from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you're not a church. Um, and I will, I will argue that to the, uh, till my last breath. You can't be a church and not be fulfilling the mission that Jesus gave to the church to make disciples. You can be a lot of things, but you're not a church. And so the vision must be rooted in the Great Commission. Um, there are other things that come along with that, but it has to start there. Our purpose, our calling is a, is a love. It's a great commandment and great commission. I'll give you that, but I'll show you where the great commandment fits right now. So the vision is rooted in the great commission. Now go down below, down at the bottom circle, and that bottom circle is values. And you'll come up with a great list of values for your church plant, I'm sure. Uh, you'll probably do some values exercises. Uh, the bottom line for me is I, I'm, I'm, I try to make things simple and reduce them, you know, boil them down to their element. And for me, the values of any church, the values of any believer ought to be rooted in the great commandment. Our values ought to stem from loving God and loving others. And so those things that contribute uh, to a great commandment lifestyle are our values. We value loving God, and that, that includes prayer, that includes Bible study, that includes a gathering uh, to worship Him, obviously, all of those kinds of value statements that would be uh, upward. And then we love others. We value evangelism. You know, the old Willow Creek saying, Willow Creek Community Church, one of the, the leaders in mega church world 30 years ago and 40 years ago, and one of those church plant success stories. Uh, one of their values is people matter to God, therefore people matter to us. It's a, that's their evangelism value. But it's rooted in the great commandment, loving God, loving others. And so vision and values are the, the, the vertical line. They are the, the bellwether, the plumb line, if you will, for what you're doing in your church. That sets the culture. That sets the DNA. Uh, the DNA is set through our vision and our values. Now, the horizontal line, though, are, are systemic elements that will animate the vision and the values. Now, on the, on the uh, left side, as I'm looking at it, is structure. On the right side is strategy. Uh, structure are those things, uh, can be as simple as your calendar. You know, you, you have worship on Sunday morning. Structure can be your small groups, classes. Structure could be the space itself, the, the physical structure of the building. Uh, it can be your bylaws, your constitution. It's the way you're organized. It's the way you put things together. It's your staffing model. All of that's part of structure. Now, um, strategy, though, is the way all of those structural pieces fit together in a process for making disciples. The strategy really animates the vision. Um, it, it makes the vision come alive. Now, 
what do you have as a church planter? What are you going to have a lot of on these of these four things? What do you think are the things that are going to be what you enter into church planting with the most of? The horizontal or the vertical? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Horizontal? Like what yeah, as, be or what will be? What you have, what you walk into a church planning situation with, do you have more of the vertical things because that's what's in your heart and in your head, or do you have more of those other things laid out, the structure? Yeah, you've got a lot of vision and values. And so you come in with a great opportunity to set up the horizontal elements to really support the vision. Now, what happens in a lot of churches and a lot of the churches that are in need of revitalization, they have a lot of structure and maybe have lost the vision. And so if you took this, if you took this chart and turned it 90 degrees, you'd find that the structures really become the vision. It's about preservation of the building. It's about preservation of who's left. It's about maintaining that that's already developed. And the vision, really, the mission has really become sustaining the church as an organization or as an institution. Now, that's true of established churches. That can be very true of church plants very quickly. Because as soon as you begin uh, to build things, whether that's building systems or building buildings or buying land or designing a worship service, you automatically enter into a tension of selling out your vision to make disciples for maintaining the programs and the processes that you start. And so what you always have to do is fight for balance between these four points. And it's kind of like a baby mobile that hangs over a crib. You know, it's got a central hub and then these things that hang off of it. If you touch one of those things, the whole, the whole model moves around. It's the same in this model. If, you're, if your vision is off, those other pieces aren't going to be in place. If your strategy is off, those other pieces are not going to be in place. If your values are off, you're certainly going to have problems. Um, and and you know, frankly, I have, I've worked with church planters, just being honest. I'm not going to name names. Uh, but Dustin could tell you the same experience, I'm sure, with from where he's been around. There are planters who very quickly face a temptation to value their donors more than they value the Great Commission. And and the love for God and the love for others can be can be <laughs> killed on the altar of making sure that the checks keep coming so that we can stay afloat. And we we uh, excuse that away and and don't don't get me wrong i understand people ought to give to the mission and we you know that's biblical you know paul sent for help the churches gave support for other churches in the new testament so i'm not suggesting you shouldn't have financial support but if that becomes the driver if the temptation becomes hey i can't I'm going to have to compromise on this value because I need this donor to stay happy. Um, you know, you're on a slippery slope. So, so values, that's why they're at the bottom. The values are really uh, the foundational piece. Uh, we kind of talk about them like an iceberg values. You know, you see a third of an iceberg or less and the rest of it's underwater. Uh, we don't see a lot of the values. They're the things that are under the surface, but they are, they're the things that will wreck the ship if we're not careful. And so, so these things all have to be in balance. You start with vision, and then your vision and values ought to dictate your structure and your strategy. Um, you know, let's talk about strategy for a minute. You're going to read a lot of cool strategies for church planting. You're going to hear a lot of success stories. You're going to read a lot of books. Um, you know, I want to write a book that's just called Blank Church. You know, fill in the blank because it seems like there's every other adjective has already been used for church. <laughs> Informational church, purpose-driven church, deep church, exponential church, um, and the list goes on and on. There's lots of church models out there. Uh, the thing you're going to have to fight is building on somebody else's strategy instead of animating the vision for your time and place and context. 
um, I mean, um, Ed Stetzer. Go ahead. I'll say, um, um, guys, this, that should be kind of reminiscent of um, one of our first uh, class periods when we talked about, you know, church planning models and approaches. And uh, Dr. Upshaw, we spent a lot of time really discussing how, you know, we often – like I thought for so many years, I found a really cool way that this church in Tacoma, Washington did things. So I'm going to try to replicate that wherever God sends me. But then what happens if God sends me to a context that that approach does not fit? And right. it's actually a hindrance to the Great Commission than a help. Um, instead, we let the context determine our approach. And that's why um, it's so key to be a, a learner and a listener and, and then develop, your, develop an indigenous um, approach and that really even affects your uh, disop- the, the culture of your disciple making. Your context is really going to affect that. It's not going to affect the, the, what you believe about the Great Commission and the Great Commandment, but your structure and your strategy should very much fit. Not only do they stem from your vision and your values, but they also need to fit where you are. Um, yeah. Your structure, your, your, from your governance to your leadership to you know, uh, <laughs> roles of the laity, all those type of structural type things. Um, especially your strategy, how you want to evangelize, is going to be different from each neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, and so that's why it's really key to, you know, to see being a church planner as this kind of missionary disciple maker, that you're a missionary, that you always learn your context. You're a disciple maker, that the Great Commission and the Great Commandment is always at the focus and it's really that kind of vision and value structure. So, um, I mean, this is, I, th- I think, especially this approach and having those things in balance, I think is so essential. Uh, because yeah. often, like Dr. Upshaw uh, was alluding to earlier, we will jump in with a structure and strategy we think is best because we saw it really, really good at our previous church or we read the good book about it, but then we get to a place and it falls. Um, and not right. necessarily because you're a bad leader, but because it was it was just a an approach that really doesn't fit. Yeah, and just two comments on that. Um, one is most of those books, we skip over the chapter where the guy tells you not to do it like he did it. Um, he says, you know, this is a model that we use in our place. There are principles you can glean, but don't do it just like I did it. And then we just, we, we are too tempted to use the template. The other thing I'll say is um, the strategy piece is the most con- contextually dependent. Um, structure and strategy, but especially your strategy. It has to be built on your context and not on your imagination. Um, Again, the quote from Ed Stetzer is, too many church planters plant the church in their minds and not the church that's in their communities. Um, They want to plant what they've already thought up instead of planting what's needed where they are. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of church planters that have that same idea, Dustin, and I've been guilty of that, too, of looking at a model. You know, Tacoma is one I'm thinking of, you know, Soma communities out there and thinking, man, that's just perfect for where I live. And I don't live in an urban setting. I live in a suburban setting. So it's not exactly perfect for where I live. I've got to find the principles from that model and adapt them for my setting. Um, So, so what questions, what other questions come to mind from, from y'all? We've discussed elements of vision, values, structure, and strategy. We've discussed a lot of those, you know, leading up to this point as we were in the kind of the preparing uh, and launching phases of kind of getting things ready. Um, so, what are some of those things that? Um, I mean, let's look at. Um, well, let's look at structure. How do you? No, Dr. Shaw, this, you can. Uh, I'm trying to, you know give them a little food for thought for questions, but this may be a question of itself, but, you know, how do you, um, inside of your structure, how do you maintain a disciple-making focus or culture five years after you've planted and you've got your own church culture established where people are used to how you worship, how you do kids' ministry, how small groups run, people are kind of used to that at that point. So how, after three, four, five years, do you not let... Um, something else kind of sabotage um, your disciple making culture, especially when it comes to something like uh, the structure. Yeah. Um, I'd say you have to start with a pretty militant um, stance on your vision uh, so that uh, when new opportunities arise, when things 
uh, when things crop up that you are uh, focused on um, or somebody comes with a great idea to have a school or a new worship service or this, that, or the other, you are militant to say, does this really match our vision to make disciples? And is this going to get us to the next step? The other thing that's going to be key for all of you is to reproduce good leaders through disciple making and seeing leadership development as an extension of making disciples. And so that you and that's that DNA piece. And so the ideal is five years down the road, uh, the leaders that are now leading have the same DNA as your core group when you started because the, the heart and passion is there. Obviously, strategy and structure are going to change as you grow. And so one of the, temp one of the things you're going to have to fight for is a scalable model of disciple making. And to me, that's the Jesus model of, of, every, of taking two or three and then in, in equipping everyone to take two or three uh, and to multiply out disciples through generational discipleship like that. Um, so if you think of it more like a family system, um, you guys may have a great uh, heritage of faith in your families. You may not. Uh, I'm fortunate that I do. And so I think about it kind of the same way where my family is church planting is that my grandparents, you know, when I was ordained, my granddad stood up and said, you know, Brian is the product of my, talking about my great grandmother uh, and her faith and her prayer that there'd one day be a preacher in the family, you know? So, so there's a, a heritage, a legacy that I, I see uh, in my family of faith and following Christ in the same way a church is a family system. And we want to project in five years, what do, you want, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want your family, your church to be known for? What are you praying for for your church? What are, your, what are your hopes and dreams? Do you want the biggest church on the block or do you want to multiply disciples for kingdom influence? And what you, what you set your ambitions on now will determine that five years later. So really, I think um, your vision really never changes. I mean, it may, you may adapt it, but if your vision is really, we want to see disciples made in this area, if it's, you know, that kind of a simple, simplified, stripped-down vision is the, the Great Commission in this community, that really will never change. You may kind of reword it, or, but I think um, part of really maintaining this discipleship, disciple-making culture, is you're always going back to and basing everything around that vision. And you're, you're, it's coming out in your preaching, it's coming out in uh, when the worship leader is leading. The small group leaders are always bringing everything that you're doing as a church, especially as a new church, back to why we're doing it. And then you're always yeah. infusing those values and saying, here's why we're doing it, and here's always how we're going to do it. And then you keep that structure and strategy in balance. Yeah, think of it this way. Um, the, the, the vertical line are the non-negotiables. Mm -hmm. Those things never change. Um, again, they may be reworded or tweaked, but the essence of those do not change. The horizontal line, those are negotiables. Those things ought to change over time. Um, you ought not to have a constitution and bylaws set up that's going to handcuff you in the future. You know, for instance, I served a church and it was in the bylaws that you had church services Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And so that was, that was law for that church. And so we had a little storm come through, you might've heard of called Hurricane Katrina and it destroyed our facilities. And so we really could not meet uh, as much. We didn't have a place to meet. Um, we gathered in different ways. And once things settled down from the crisis and one of our church curmudgeons wanted to cause trouble, he pulled out the bylaws and said, I move that we immediately return to Wednesday night services because it's what it says in the bylaws. Wow. And that's an example of how something that ought to be negotiable became non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. uh, so those things, structure and strategy pieces have to be, uh, have to morph over time because your community's gonna change, your structure's gonna change. Um, you know, one of the lids for church growth is when that small church that deals with committees gets to a much larger size and it's not scalable to have committees making all the choices. It's just clunky and cumbersome for a church of 500 or a thousand to have every decision go through 
several layers of bureaucracy. And so that's not a scalable church governing model. And that's a different discussion, but that's just an example of how structure and strategy uh, needs to be adaptable over time. And it's a good word because your, your, your church plant doesn't stay a church plant forever. You know, that's, that's really right. the, 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 the planting phase is really just a small stage of life in the life of the church because you will grow and mature. You're hopefully reproduced. You'll become an old church after a while. You know, you'll be around for 30, 40, 50 years. Um, churches that, you know, I grew up in were all older than my grandparents, uh, older than my parents at least. And um, yeah. so this is really just a phase. But I think if, as you infuse and build it on this foundation of um, creating this culture of discipleship and disciple making that always is, is, is governing and deciding uh, from your vision and values, it's deciding your structure and strategy and always adapting, your church can always kind of healthily grow because it's growing in, in the right way. Um, uh, guys, do you have any, uh, we got to conclude here in about two or three minutes. Do you have any questions um, for Dr. Upshaw related to uh, today? Dr. I think you just covered everything so brilliant. So yeah. These guys just, uh, um, I, I will ask this one question as we conclude. You can see the interest on their faces. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's the morning time. It's, uh, we, only I, some of us no. have had our coffee so far. But um, uh, let me ask you this as we uh, conclude, and we'll kind of end on this. Because um, you, you've been involved in, in a consulting and training with um, churches of all uh, stages of life. From uh, You've helped uh, guys like myself who were uh, in this kind of envisioning a church plant for a future time. You've helped planters who were in the middle of it. You've helped uh, young pastors who were leading churches that were 20, 30 years old. You've helped pastors who were you know, uh, leading churches that were 100 years old. And so um, I know your team uh, does a lot in the consulting realm. What have you noticed has been one of the key um, key factors that has harmed a disciple-making culture um, inside of a church at any age or stage? Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's a good question. There's a lot of things on that list. Um I have become more and more convinced of the importance of the leader modeling what matters. Mm. And so, you know, John Maxwell, I'm not necessarily a great fan of Maxwell, but his, his statement, I think is true. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Mm. And, um, if the, if the leader, If the pastor has not made a commitment to personally be involved in evangelism and discipleship, uh, he has no credibility to ask his people to be involved in that. And so if he's not seeking to embody a disciple-making culture in his life, uh, you're not going to see it in the church. Um, The the church will will rise uh, to the level of its leadership or sink to the level of its leadership. Um, You know, we've tried to say we can, we can create this culture. Somebody else in the church will come to us and say, we're frustrated. We, we want to see disciples made, but our pastor, you know, and there's always two sides to every story. But in my experience, if you've got a pastor who's not going to want to play, uh, you're not going to have much forward momentum on changing anything in the culture of the church. So uh, I would just admonish you guys to be, to be about personal, uh, make a habit of a lifestyle of personal disciple making, personal evangelism, personal involvement in discipleship yourselves uh, so that it is part of your DNA. It's part of your culture. And, you know, we'll go back to where we first started. When I asked what culture is, somebody said people. That's exactly right. Uh, You're one of them. And so you bring the culture. That's good. That's good. And, and leaders are really influential in creating that culture, as we talked about at the beginning. Um, and uh, so um, I think that's a great word for us as uh, we're all um, endeavoring in some way, shape, or form in this class to be a leader um, in some type of church planting or revitalization um, effort. Or um, even uh, many of us are really wanting to just invigorate our church to become a church planting church. And so yeah. I think modeling that as a leader is going to be one of those uh, uh, key key things that if that's not part of even your vision as a leader uh, is to model model the way, um, then um, 
Uh, it's going to be uh, a struggle when your vision and values um, aren't solidified, then e so easily your structure and strategy will become sabotaged and it'll get distracted by everything else in ministry other than a focus on the Great Commission. So, uh, Dr. Upshaw, thank you so much for your, for your time this morning. And uh, we uh, greatly appreciate it and always have love having you in class. And um, we enjoy uh, connecting with you in the future. My pleasure. Sorry I can't be with you in person. Thanks. Oh, it's all good. And uh, we will, we'll see you soon. Is, is it okay if I uh, emailed this PowerPoint uh, to the students? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Great, great. Thank you so much. No, no, Sean, Thank you. Take care. And uh, I will see you uh, next uh, Monday. All right. See you then. Thanks, right. guys. Take care. Bye.